Hello, Sunshine. I'm Alexi Lawless, and welcome to the State of the Union podcast, where we look at the beautiful game on and off the field through the lens of red, white, and blue colored glasses. This week, we'll be talking, well, U.S. men's national team wrapping up that uh, window, Selfie Gate, Neymar, Gladiator, the weather, MLS, Super Bowl, Milan, AFCON, Pulisic, and much, much more. But first, joining me as always, my friend, my colleague, my guiding light, David Mossy, a soccer savant and a Fox soccer researcher and writer extraordinaire. How are you on this Monday, February 7th, Moose? I am doing very well. Happy to be back in the studio. And you know, now when I look at you, all I can think of is this is what Red Gerard is going to look like in about 20 years. Yeah, I continue to uh, grow this beard. I mean, I don't even, I don't even know if it's COVID beard anymore because we're so far into it. It's just laziness beard and we had a lot of uh january off and so i didn't have to do anything and then when we knew we were going to go up to uh minnesota i said well this is apropos i mean this this is very northern-esque and uh so and i just haven't i haven't had a chance to shave it but um i like it my wife hates it and will not even come close to me even in the best circumstances it's uh debatable whether she will but Certainly with, uh, with, with this beard, it's not happening. One thing that bugs her with it is that it, it retains moisture uh, uh, unnecessarily, <laughs> especially after uh, either showering or, uh, or sweating. So it's, she's not having any of it. So it, it, it will be gone soon. Well, to explain the Red Gerard reference, which apparently went over your head, he's a famous yeah. American snowboarder currently competing in the Winter Olympics. Have you gotten into the Olympics at all? The, the Olympics are, are happening now? Yes. Uh, wh wh who's playing in them? What, uh... Uh, these are the Winter Olympics taking place in China. I hadn't heard. Okay. Not all even right. on your radar. No, I didn't, I didn't realize that was happening. Okay. Um, and this is a uh, figure skater? Snowboarder. Same thing. Um, okay. All right. Well, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll check it out. Is this something that happens live or do we, is there like a wrap up type of thing here? I've been watching it on Peacock. Yeah. Peacock does EPL, right? Correct. We had a great show last week, Mossy. I don't know. I mean, it, it, we, we set a pretty high bar. We're pretty awesome. But last week in particular was, was really good. And I'm trying to think if there was something, I don't know, did we do something different last week? Was there, was there anything different last week? There was somebody notice, noticeably absent. What? Who, was, who wasn't there? I was there. You were there, right? Uh, Luis Aguilar, who I still don't know why he wasn't there, mind you. Ah, I didn't even there. think about that. Maybe that's what the, the deal was. But he's back this week, right? I can, I can hear him. I can feel him in, is, in the yes. background, right? Like, uh, like Vader, you can sense him. Do, do you know the expression addition by subtraction? Yes, I do. Um, well, listen, he's, he's got a lot to live up to with because... In, and the, he could have gotten Wally Pipped, but we've, we brought him back. It was a delightful English chap who stepped in for him. Uh, <laughs> I miss that guy. He was re delightful English. He reminiscing with you about U.S. England yes. games in the early 90s. Yes. It, was, it was very nice. It was very nice. Um, nice little respite. But we're back. We're back to the grind uh, with our master uh, when it comes to uh, Luis. We're, we're happy to have you back. But you know what? You got you to gotta bring it. And I think you did. At least uh, the rundown so far looks good. Mossy, uh, did you watch anything this week? Well, let's get right into it. I gave you a homework assignment at the end of last week's mm -hmm. pod, and you told me that you've completed that homework assignment. Yes, the Neymar documentary. Yeah. Uh, I was uh, at a uh, girls' high school game this week. Um, not just watching <laughs> high school girls run around. I actually have a, a high school uh, age daughter who is playing soccer. And I was talking with one of the parents there, and he said, you know, I'm a huge Messi fan, always have been. And... I watched the documentary and he said he didn't really like Neymar, you know, with the flopping and all that kind of stuff. And he said, I like him now. It turned me to his favor. It, and, and I told him, well, that was the intention and hook, line and sinker you are in. Uh, last week, I mentioned that the part that I had seen was, you know, very sizzle uh, PR marketing uh, type of thing and, and very positive, as you can imagine, because he's participating in it. Uh, it got a little bit more in depth as we went along into the, the, the second and third episode. There's only, there's only three. Um, the, uh, the accusations when it came uh, to the rape accusations that he had and all that, I thought was, it was interesting the way that they included it and the way that they covered it. I think, I, I think ultimately it is worth your time 
I think you do get a better idea of not just what Neymar is, but what I guess the modern athlete is in terms of looking beyond the kicking of the ball. I, I'm not sure I trust his father. Okay. And, and once again, this is all based on what they put out. So whatever reaction I have is relative to what I saw on the screen. It could be a lovely man, but I'm not sure I, I trust his father completely as to what's going on. But I do feel that in a certain sense, he does have his best interests at heart and wants to create something that is going to be there after he stops kicking the ball, which I guess is what nowadays athletes would call their brand and making sure that when that ball stops rolling from, from him, there is something to continue on. I thought the footage was great. As a Brazilian who loves Neymar as a player, I enjoyed reliving uh, different parts of his career, going all the way back to the Santos days. But what hampered the documentary for me is I found Neymar to be shockingly inarticulate and incapable of any thoughtful introspection about his career. The parts whoa, whoa, where he on. was on camera speaking were... <laughs> so you, you are shocked that an athlete, all right, is not... Uh, does not have the ability to express themselves and is not uh, cerebral in the way that you want and maybe lacks, um, you know, depth uh, and emotion. That's something that is that is new and crazy and different from you. One, you ever watch sports? One part that was pretty poignant was when Neymar described his relationship with his father as being very professional. <laughs> and that made me sad. And, and yeah. you know, no, on a serious note, after he gets accused of rape, they show us this conversation between him and his father in which all his father cares about is what this is going to do to his brand and his image and the business. And I'm sitting there thinking, this is where why you need to separate family from business. You need a father in that moment, not a manager. Mm -hmm. um, and I know a lot of players are represented by, by their parents. They feel a sense of trust, but I don't know. I, I've, I've always questioned that arrangement. I feel like... You know, I think it's hard. I think it is. I think it is really hard. It's also, you know, this documentary, you know, Neymar... And, and those a little bit before him, and certainly those all of those after him, have come about at a time where we record everything, and everything is there in terms of the camera. And so the footage that we have, and therefore I think a much better glimpse back into who these, not just players were, but then kids were, it's really amazing. I mean, you get Neymar at a very young age, not only running around on the field, but talking and being interviewed. And that's, that's always cool for me to see how how these where these players have come from and in in my day and age yeah we had we had pictures and movies and stuff like that but the extent at which we did it was paled in comparison to what happens where we document every single step of our of our kids life his mother seems like a sweet lady yep. but not exactly madame curie so <laughs> she didn't bring much intellectually to the documentary in the final analysis uh, you know and i've heard this said about neymar before you know you take two college kids and one of them uh studies in all his free time and gets a 4.0 and that would be Messi and Ronaldo. And then there's that kid who's smart enough that he knows he can sort of screw around and party and still just on natural intelligence alone get a 3.3 GPA and they're comfortable with that. And that seems to be where we're at with Neymar. He, there seems to be some recognition that his career w hasn't been all it could have been, but he's comfortable making that trade-off where he still had a very good career and he's gotten to have a lot of fun in his life. You know, if you gave him truth serum, he'd probably say he looks at Messi and how he's lived his personal life and said, well, he's, it's kind of boring. I wouldn't want to be like that. But M M Messi feels like it's all about just extracting the most out of his talent and his, in his career. So it's well, just, well, not to, to stereotype, but isn't that the Brazilian way? I mean, isn't that the characteristic and the personality that not only exists, and I know I'm stereotyping a little bit, but one that we celebrate. Isn't that kind of what we want from Brazilian players is that there is this, this beauty and this romance that that transcends the game that, that, uh, that drives them. Absolutely. I mean, make no mistake. I could be the greatest podcaster in history, but you know, I'm, I'm not going to work on that. I, last night I was out till three o'clock in the morning in the clubs. I'm hung over now, but you know, just on natural it's talent alone, it, I'm going to, It's yeah. worth it because it's, it's, it's who you are. It is, is part of yeah, your, your right. makeup. It's your ethos to celebrate every single moment of life out there, even at the the cost and the expense of something that's going to come later. You, you have that moment when you danced or when you fell in love or when you sang or did all that kind of stuff. And that's worth, that's worth more than any type of, you know, problems that are come later because of that. I, I did find the scenes with Neymar and his son pretty touching. Yep. And so that would be probably what your friend saw that made him think about Neymar differently. That's a side of him we don't normally see. Yeah. I mean, I, I just think we, 
we saw a lot of different sides to him and you got to know him a whole lot more. And as I said, that's what the intention was from the start was to, you know, win hearts and minds out there that may be on the fence about Neymar or don't know a whole lot about Neymar. And there's still a lot of people around the world that don't know a whole lot uh, about Neymar. Uh, did you watch anything else? No, I did attend uh, this weekend uh, Knicks Lakers game at Staples Center. I saw LeBron James play live. I have to say, I don't want to come off like that old man on the lawn, but boy, NBA games now, they just blare the music the entire time. And it's insufferable. I mean, there was a minute left in the game, this close game, the fans are into it. And this moron DJ, whoever he is, is like <laughs> blasting DMX. Y'all gonna make me lose my mind up. And, and I'm sitting here thinking like, just let the game breathe for a second. And it, I don't know what it is about American sports culture now where you go to an NBA game and they have to be blaring music the entire time. Every time a team is dribbling up the court, there's got to be a different song that's... So wait, the, the music is happening while they're dribbling? Yes. No. With a minute left in the game, no, a close no, game. No, no, no. Absolutely. No, I don't, I don't think that that's true. I don't think <laughs> Luis? that's true. Luis? It is true. It's true. I'm, getting, I'm getting all sorts of multiple people saying that, that that is true. That that to me is a little weird. Yeah. You know, I mean, look, I'm all for the entertainment uh, aspect of sports and, and all that. And I, I lean into it <laughs> as much as anybody out there. Okay, that's that's a little strange. Because I, I always thought that when the because in hockey, as soon as the puck is dropped, the music stops. So it's it's just filling in the spaces in between. I don't care how loud it is. I mean, yeah, you are kind of grumpy when the, when it comes to how loud you are. All right, well, did they win? Did the uh, well, Lakers of Los Angeles win? I'm also grumpy because my beloved Knicks blew like a 20 point lead and lost the Lakers in overtime. Oh, are, are the Knicks any good? Uh, no, not this season. Okay, they're not any good. Uh, let's see. I got a couple of things uh, for people. So uh, there's a new one on Netflix uh, documentary called The Tinder Swindle. Have you ever been on this thing called Tinder? You know what this thing is? Uh, I know what it is. I have not been on it. You haven't. It's yeah. some sort of dating app, right? Correct. All right. Well, anyway, um, I haven't been on it. Uh, my wife may have been, but I haven't. Um, the Tinder Swindle is a pretty cool, interesting documentary about this um, this con man who would swindle multiple women out of their money by claiming to be the son of a um, you know a billionaire diamond uh, guy and all this kind of stuff and how. How, how, what he did, how he did it, and then ultimately how he got caught. Um, it's interesting. Uh, so I, th I, I think it's worth it. It's just uh, like an hour and a half or something like that. It's not multiple episodes or anything. Uh, then I, I, in, the, in the retro, I guess there's a couple retro things here. There's a movie in 1981 that stars Meryl Streep and Jeremy Irons called The French Lieutenant's Woman. Um, it's based off a book. And when it came out, it was very, very popular. And it's one of those things that over the years I've seen constantly, I just never wanted to click on it for whatever, for whatever reason. Either, either I just had the feeling it wasn't going to be good. And finally, the other night I said, you know, this is a classic. I've heard so much about it. It was nominated for five Academy Awards. Uh, Meryl Streep, obviously, if she's in a movie, she's going to get nominated for a, 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 uh, uh, an Academy Award. And I watched it what a piece of crap of a movie this is. Holy mother of God, how is it possible? I, I wanted to like it. I went in with good intentions. Obviously, wonderful cast, Jeremy Irons and, and Meryl Streep. Oh my God, it's just so horrible. It's, it's clunky. It's not interesting. It's not remotely romantic. Um, it's, it tries to do this present day with past day type of thing. And it's just, it, it's, uh, it's ridiculous. So I don't know how in 1991 we were looking at that saying that's, uh, that's great. There will be those out there that will disagree with me, but I am not giving any type of thumbs up. If you haven't watched it before, I'm not giving any types of thumbs up. And if you have, maybe you like it, maybe you, uh, you don't. Then, uh, have you seen this, by the way? No. Okay. Uh, I don't think you're going to see it. So, and then finally... So my son, uh, 13 years old, he's uh, in uh, seventh grade right now, and he is uh, studying the, uh, the Roman Empire, right? So dad of the year over here says, we got to watch Gladiator, <laughs> right? Because whenever you think about, you know, learning the ins and outs uh, and, and really understanding the, uh, you know, the history and all of the different uh, uh, you know, twists and turns of the Roman Empire, you think, obviously, of <laughs> Gladiator. So uh, we started watching it. I didn't remember how violent it was, um, which, is, which is fine. We, uh, we dealt with it. 
but it it still holds up. It's still a pretty incredible um, movie in totality uh, with the acting and the scenes and the storyline. Russell Crowe uh, is incredible in it. Um, the guy from Joker. Uh, uh, um, uh, who's the guy that played uh, in uh, The Joker? Um, what's his name? No. Uh, I'm pretty, pretty sure it wasn't Heath Ledger. It was, this is, you know, this the, was a recently made film. No, the brother of uh, the, the how the hell can we not figure this out? Oh, uh, I'm sorry. We're talking yes. about, I'm sorry. I'm talking about I'm talking about the Gladiator, of course. Right. Um, Joaquin. Yeah. So this is 20 years ago. So it could have been Heath Ledger. Right. Um, I can't believe it's 20 um, years ago. By the way, um, um, yeah, Joaquin Phoenix was is uh, is wonderful in that. So uh, I don't know if he learned anything that's going to help him in terms of his studies of the Roman Empire or anything like that. But there were a couple times when. Um, you know, this, this back and forth between the emperor and the Senate and the division of powers that I saw him over in the corner say, mm, uh, mm, because he was relating, you know, the struggle for power. And I keep asking him, you know, what happened with the Roman empire? Why did they lose everything that they had? And, you know, he goes into a bunch of different things, including, you know, whether it's practical things like, uh, like disease or whether it's expanded too much or whether it was the corruption ultimately and the power that was involved at the leadership and, and this back and forth and this, uh, this struggle between the, uh, the rule of the Senate who in, in and of itself was corrupt and the rule of a, you know, an emperor, a dictator and how much and little of that. So anyway, uh, gladiator still holds up and it was good to hear. Yeah. One of my favorites. I did see the edge of war on your recommendation yes. and enjoyed it. You did. And I saw another movie called the lost daughter on my father's recommendation. Yeah. That's nominated for some stuff. Uh, right? I enjoyed that as well. Very artsy fartsy. So okay. I know you'll take to it, but also coming back later this month, one of my favorite TV shows, my brilliant friend, a uh, new season of that on HBO. So I can't wait. So. Got it. Got it. Uh, by the way, this has been a very, very beefy opening segment. So I'm not going to get into this here, but I just want to tease it. At the end of the podcast, I will share some thoughts on the Michigan football program and the Jim Harbaugh saga. Yes. All right. Good tease. Good tease for uh, for later on. And I suppose uh, next week I'll have uh, my son and I will have watched Ben Hur and Spartacus. So we'll, <laughs> we'll continue on with that thing. All right. You ready to light this candle? Let's do it. All right. We're going to jump right into it. Uh, last night I sat, or, or, or yesterday, I sat outside in the uh, in the glorious and warm Southern California sun and just... Uh, and just soaked it all in literally and enjoyed and thanked my lucky stars about uh, the place that we live. It's got plenty of problems, but it's still very, very nice. And then I juxtaposed it with where I was midweek in the freezing Arctic tundra-esque type of uh, conditions of uh, Minnesota and in particular uh, in uh, St. Paul where the uh, U.S. took on Honduras. Uh, quick thoughts, Mossy, on just this game in general, all right, in terms of the performance. We'll get to a lot of the other stories that are around it. I mean, Mission I accomplished, right? Yeah, I don't want to come off like a negative Nancy here, but I found the gut check aspect of this game um, a little bit contrived only because um, Honduras are so bad and they're not even trying anymore that I looked at this window as these were three points in the bag and then how good this window was would hinge on what they did in the other two games. They mm -hmm. beat El Salvador 1-0. They lost to Canada 2-0. So six points out of nine. We can debate uh, what that means in terms of the window overall. But I, I don't want to give too much credit to the U.S. for stepping up under pressure just because as soon as the match kicked off, you could just tell that, that Honduras just wasn't up for it at all. And so this was going to be an easy one. Um, and as, as for the weather, I, I remain convinced that it was a mistake to play this game in these conditions. I know there's an argument out there that, you know, the fact that Honduras really struggled with it and a couple of their players actually had to come off due to hypothermia, mm -hmm. that somehow that validated the decision. But I, I think that misses the point. Um, if this game had been played in perfect conditions, to me, there's no question the U.S. would have won handily. So all you did was, was create a potential variable that could have impacted your team. It didn't. They handled it okay, fine. But, you know, and you're hearing now, you know, the U.S. players said everything to the right things publicly, but now you're hearing some grumbling emanating from the camp that the players weren't thrilled about the conditions and have kind of made it known to U.S. soccer, let's not ever do this again. So I still remain convinced that it was a mistake to put the game here, but they got away with it. So I, I feel like they won in spite of the conditions, not because of them, I guess would be okay. my point. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, to your point, I don't think it's going to happen again. Um, I think it was a one-off type of event. Yes, it resulted in three points, which is a good thing and ultimately the most important thing. But uh, And yes, the ideal that they had envisioned did not come to fruition. And I say they, I mean uh, Greg Berhalter. 
and uh, Ernie Stewart and uh, Brian McBride. However, um, when it comes to the conditions that were created, you know, I've heard and listened to American soccer folks out there um, whine and cry and lament the fact that American soccer players and American soccer teams lack the, um, the guile and the gamesmanship and the fortitude to do what needs to be done in order to win. This is a team, um, as we know, coached by Greg Berhalter, that did not make the World Cup last year. Uh, excuse me, last, uh, last cycle. And while it was a constant and an ex- expectation, and it, and it still is when it comes to being an expectation, uh, that was the biggest failure in U.S. soccer history. And this team under Greg Berhalter is trying to rectify that situation and get back to where I think we all feel that we belong. They have gone out of their way to do everything possible Um, and leave no stone unturned to give this team the best possible chance of success. Some people agree with the decisions. Some people don't agree with decisions. But I think that we can all agree that when it comes to uh, the best intentions, that Greg Berhalter and company are doing what they feel they need to do. They created a situation that absolutely was... um, a disadvantage for the opposition in a way and in the same way that has been done for decades now when it comes to the United States playing uh, difficult situations. Oftentimes, and almost uh, exclusively, it has been about putting the United States in, um, in circumstances where it's incredibly hot, oftentimes in the, the hottest part of the day, uh, you're talking about uh, humidity. You are talking about a hostile environment when it comes to the fans, whether it's at the hotel, whether it's at the airport, whether it's on the way to the stadium, whether it's in the stadium, whether it's around the stadium. You are talking about um, smog or 100,000 people at, uh, at, uh, at the Azteca. You're talking about difficult situations that are are specifically designed to put the opposition at a disadvantage. I ultimately think that is what happened. You know, you talked about, look, I don't, I don't want anybody to get hurt, okay? No, I don't want anybody to get hurt. I want people to be uncomfortable. And I want people to recognize that in the same way that the United States players and the United States teams over the years have had to adapt and adjust to hostile environments, our opposition is going to have uh, hap- uh, have that happen, and I don't, I don't, I don't doubt that there are American players that didn't like doing that, but they did it, and they did it better than the opposition. All right? Why were no uh, American players um, suffering from hypothermia? They're tougher. No, they prepared better <laughs> and they adjusted to the situation better than the opposition. Okay, when Kobe Jones is coming off of the field and hawking up a gray loogie and Azteca because of the incredibly difficult circumstances and situations that he has been through. Nobody's crying for him. Nobody's crying for the U.S. team when they have, uh, when they have problems playing in those, in those types of environments. And again, I'm not saying that the U.S. couldn't have beaten uh, Honduras in insert your warm weather region. But again, this is a team that did not qualify for the World Cup. And it behooves whoever's in charge, and in this case, it's Greg Berhalter, to do everything in his power to hedge your bets. And I think that's why this, uh, this was done. And you know, the environment, was it cold? Yeah. By the way, it wasn't as cold as the, I think it was the 2013 MLS Cup that I went to in, uh, in Kansas City. That actually uh, was colder. I prepared for it, as did everybody in that in that stadium. Everybody had a wonderful time. Ultimately, we got the uh, the three points. I was proud of the performance. I'm not going to say that you know this was the greatest win. It was, for my money, the most important game in Greg Berhalter's coaching career. And they came out. They got the result. Those screaming and yelling about set pieces and, oh, we have to rely on set pieces. They all count the same last time I checked. And the reason why you get set piece goals is because you have consistently done something in the attack that has created this either the corner kicks or the, uh, 
um, or the fouls that lead to those uh, types of set pieces. So I'll take them any way they come. I have no problem that it was all, uh, it was a set piece orgy, if you will, up there in, uh, in Minnesota. We got the result. Um, we got the, uh, the experience. And as I said on air, you know, I was, uh, I was left thinking about the great Debbie Allen from fame, uh, who said that fame costs and right here is where you start paying for it. And this team, yes, it was a difficult situation. They rose above it and they used it to their advantage. And that experience, you know, we talk about this team, how young and inexperienced they are. That experience will bloody them. That experience will serve them well. That experience, I think, is going to be in the recesses of their mind, whether they realize it or not. And again, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen again. But all of those little lessons learned, all of those little collective experiences that they've had and those shared experiences that they have, that's what makes this team more mature. That's what makes this team better. So um, I don't think that Greg Berhalter or anybody should apologize for having the best intentions of giving this team the best possible chance of winning and getting the three points and getting that much closer to qualifying for the World Cup. As far as Christian Pulisic, I'm always fascinated by the rested versus dropped corollary. Uh, players, uh, certain players achieve a status where if you watch a Bayern Munich game and the team sheet comes out and you see Robert Lewandowski on the bench, it's not that he was dropped. It's that he's being rested, they're rotating, et cetera. You don't view it that way. Uh, going into this qualifying campaign, Christian Pulisic sort of had that status where you think if the U.S. is playing three games in seven days and he doesn't start one of them, it must be because Greg Berhalter is rotating and doesn't want to put too many miles on uh, but this felt like him being dropped. Would you agree? And, yeah, and, and what did it was you make him being of, dropped. What, what did you make of that decision? I think it was a big call from Greg Berhalter because it's Christian Pulisic. If it's somebody else, then nobody's going to, nobody's going to, they're not going to care as much, but it's Christian Pulisic. It's Christian Pulisic at a time where he's underperforming. It's Christian Pulisic at a time where there are a lot of questions as to what's wrong with Christian Pulisic. How do you solve a, a problem like Christian Pulisic? And, you know, it's also a time when Greg Berhalter is under a tremendous amount of scrutiny and pressure, and rightfully so, and fairly so, for getting this team to win and getting this team uh, to the World Cup. And you are sitting, arguably, your best player. And that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a big deal. Um, we're going to talk more about Greg Berhalter relative to uh, Christian Pulisic, but it, you know, he replaced him with a Jordan Morris um, and this is a player that's been out for most of the year uh, or most of last year with his second uh, knee injury. I didn't think Jordan had a great game, but I didn't think that Jordan Morris had a bad game. And I also don't think that the game that Jordan Morris had, we would have taken that type of performance from a Christian Pulisic in previous games. Yeah, Luis Aguilar, in his infinite wisdom, picked three Ask Alexi questions about the U.S. national team. So pretty much anything we say in this segment is stepping on the Ask Alexi segment. But what well, not do? not everything because uh, you know we we do need uh, to look talk. at him. Look at him shaking his head, very defensive He's, over there. You know, it's like. Uh, but but then but then Burhalter, interestingly enough, he brings Pulisic on. Mm -hmm. Some people, like our good friend Eric Ronaldo, were questioning that, and and I get where Eric was coming from. The game was decided, and in that sort of weather, the guys had all sorts of muscle problems. You figure, why bring him on and risk the injury? It kind of worked out perfectly because he comes on, he doesn't get injured, he scores a goal. So he comes out of this window feeling better about himself. While if he hadn't played at all, you're happy the U.S. wins, but then you would have had this lingering Pulisic issue coming out of this window. So it actually ended up working out perfectly. You know, as I've said before about Christian Pulisic, I, I don't need him to be the star every single game. I don't need him to be messy and carry this team. And even the notion that he is carrying this team or carrying soccer, I would push back on that. That's not the case. As I've said before, what the reality is, is that his teammates, they're the ones carrying him. What I need him to be and what we need him to be for this team is a consistent factor. And he hasn't been. And I don't know, whatever it is. I mean, as I said on air the other day, this is this is the national team. This is not, this is not therapy. Um, this is not, uh, charity. This is about getting people together to do a job. And if you can't do the job, then go figure out what the problem is and then come back in. All right. Now, Christian Pulisic is going to get the benefit of the doubt. And that's, that's okay. That's, that's fair because of the player that he is, but you know, I, I, we have to have a functioning Christian Pulisic for him to be of value. Because 
we're in a moment where we have a lot of depth and a lot of different options. And so it's not as if, you know, even a, an 80% Christian Pulisic is good enough. No, it's not. Because there's others that even, there's others that if they're playing at 85 or 90% or 100%, they actually could do the job better. And that's not a good thing. That's not a good thing. Well, we'll talk about uh, well, Greg Berhalter. You, and, and you mentioned the set pieces. Um, the U.S. might have found something with Acosta. I thought mm-hmm. his deliveries were excellent. They hadn't scored a set piece goal this entire qualifying campaign, and then they scored three in this game. And that might be something if Acosta keeps taking them that uh, will carry over to future games. I also was very impressed with Luca Della Torre. The U.S., I think, has uncovered another option there in the midfield, so I could see him yeah, I mean, I think moving forward. Yeah, uh, he he was good. Uh, I, I think it is. I mean, to your point, it's it's dangerous to put too much uh, to give too much credit. But you you play the cards that are dealt with you uh, uh, to you, and those players did. And so to the, you know, the to the victor go the spoils. And if you're part of that game, and you played well, that's going to help you going forward. But just because a, a player played well in that game against Honduras in that type of setting doesn't automatically mean they should be starting. Or just because, uh, you know, just because a, a player doesn't play well doesn't mean that they uh, that they aren't going to start going forward. This was a one-off game, and you take from it, yes, some information, but you uh, uh, you go on. Um, should we move to selfies? Yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, this sort of circles back around to my initial point, which is we built this up as the the biggest game in Greg Berhalter's career in your eyes. And then once it starts, Honduras are so bad that it all feels sort of anticlimactic to the point where in the second half, the coach is taking selfies with fans. So it it, it, it is hard to sell this as like a massive win if Berhalter was that switched off at that point where he was willing to do that. <laughs> all right, listen. You and others out there that are sitting around smugly tooting and, and shaking your head in your uh, sanctimonious, um, snobby type of way. I remember when you were fun, man. I, I remember when you, do you remember laughter? Do you remember any of that? I mean, this is a day and age where we, we are dying for personality and we are we are choking it out of not just the game, but all of the players that could possibly give us personality because they're scared to death to do anything. This is, this is a, a time in sports where, you know, you, you poke your head out in any, top, any way and somebody's going to lop it off. This is a time in sports where, God forbid, you say something that is different or do something that's different or do something that's interesting that, that shows that you're more than this Neanderthal uh, monosyllabic type of uh, being. And Greg Berhalter, while you can agree and disagree with his decisions, he's an interesting personality. He's interesting to talk about. He says things that are interesting and provocative. We saw after the Canada game. And while, again, I may not have done that or I might disagree with him saying that. I love that he is doing these types of things. I love that that he is someone that we are talking about. And when you put yourself out there and you do these types of things, uh, you better know, and he's been around long enough, he's, he understands how the world works, that you are going to get criticism. And people, especially in this day and age where everybody's got a uh, bullhorn, everybody's got a platform, people are going to come down on you. I mean, this is what we're worried about. You're worried about your coach in a game that was, to your point, over, that a game that were, there was a stoppage going on on the field, that he turned around and took a selfie with some fans, okay? Your friend Eric Winalda was all bent out of shape the other day because the players didn't go and sign autographs for some kid on the sideline, uh, and he was screaming and yelling about that, and your coach turns around and goes and actually takes a picture with some people. It was, I, I thought it was completely innocuous and benign. Now, you know, I, I made the argument that had, you know, if this happens down in Azteca and Tata Martino does this as, as they are kicking the crap out of us 3 nothing, which certainly could happen, would I be all up in arms and screaming and yelling about it? I'd laugh about it. And yeah, it would, it would hurt me a little bit. And so if you're Honduran and you're pissed off about that, all right, 
cry me a river, go, you know, we're not going to see Honduras for however long. And I would expect at that point, given what we have done to them and the incredible affront that this has been to their nation, whether it's our coach taking a selfie or having them play in, uh, in, uh, in the, uh, in the cold temperatures, they're going to find a way to get back at us. And I would, I would, I would expect nothing less, but I, I just, this is, this is ridiculous. And the, the clutching of pearls out there by people is, um, as I said, it's, it's hypocritical at times. It's definitely sanctimonious and it, and it's, and it's laughable. Excuse my ignorance here, but are people making a huge deal about this? I haven't. Yeah, it's a big deal. Wow. It's a big deal. Yeah. People, it's a big deal in particular because it's Greg Berhalter and there's a lot of people out there that don't like him as a coach. There's a lot of people out that don't feel that he is the right coach and that, he is not doing all he could possibly do with the group. And this is, I mean, look, this also comes on, not the heels, but a few years later, we look back at in Kuva uh, and getting carried over the water and, you know, all these different messages and optics, appearances, all that kind of stuff, uh, all that kind of stuff matters. And look, Greg Berhalter is, is calculated. And would he, if given the opportunity, do this again, given the, uh, the outcry? But, you know, I, I, I would expect it from the Hondurans, okay? But this is what the U.S. soccer fan base is pissed off about? Get out of here. I, I will say, to bring it back to the team, uh, big picture, mm -hmm. the U.S., if you look at this qualifying campaign, they haven't had a spectacular window, nope. but they also haven't had a bad one. I feel like everyone has fallen in that realm of, eh, pretty good, fine, I'll take it, nothing wrong with that. You know, you go into it expecting more. Like you wrote a I column. I expected nine. You I expected saying, nine points. So I am disappointed that they didn't get nine po by, points. By the way, ultimately, it comes down to the candidate. By the way, you and I are both writing for foxsoccer.com now. No, so people amazing. can check out our pieces there on World Cup qualifying. I'm, I'm doing Europe and South America. Lexi wrote one on the U.S. But so you asked for nine. You got six. I feel like that's been the story of this qualifying campaign. We're going into it. We're talking about, oh, they got to win all three, get nine. And then they end up getting something less than that. But you look at the standings at the end and say, well, they're okay. I mean, it, nothing wrong with where they are. So, and you know, you string together enough pretty good windows, you're going to make the World Cup. So here we are, there's one left. And yeah, sure, what, would it be nice if they produced three great performances and went to Aztec and won and went to Costa Rica and won? But they don't really have to. Another just pretty good window will we'll do, we'll do the job. And, you know, it's all about getting to the World Cup. So. In 2002, when we were a handball away or VAR away from possibly going to a semifinal of a World Cup, it's not as if we crushed everybody in qualifying. It wasn't a spectacular qualifying campaign. And so, yeah, but... But I'm, I'm always worried and wary. I am cautiously optimistic about what this team has done. But Greg Berhalter and this team, they haven't gotten us back to the World Cup yet. And they have one window to do it. Uh, they, they are sitting in a good position. But let's be honest, last time we were sitting in a good position and we let it get away. And his job, you know, I said that that was the most important game. Yeah, the next one's the most important game. These next three games and this next window are crucial. And yes, they can make it easy by you know, getting the points and putting it to bed. And maybe that happens in the first game against Mexico. Maybe it happens in the second game, which we will be televising down in Orlando. There's a lot of different ways for it to happen, but it is in with, it's within, it's within reach. They should smell it. They should taste it. They should put both hands on it and don't let it get away. Like it got away last time. We, we got criticized uh, last week for we not discussing the other CONCACAF teams. To be fair, Luis Aguilar had it in the rundown and we blew past it. Yeah. Uh, but now having given Luis Aguilar credit for that, I, I do have to point out he has the wrong points total for Canada. They have 25 points, not 22. Typical. Um, Typical. But so very quickly, Canada with a nine-point window, three straight 2-0 uh, wins. Um, they, they wrapped it after the U.S. They beat El Salvador 2-0 away from home. Uh, so they're now to the point. Their next game is away to Costa Rica. If they win that game, they're in. And even with a point, uh, they would be in so long as either Panama doesn't beat Honduras or the U.S. doesn't beat Mexico at Azteca. So I think pretty good chance Canada is going to seal the deal in the next match day here. Uh, I know you love this story. How impressed have you been with Canada overall in this qualifying it's great. campaign? It's great. And, and, you know, the irony is that they are doing it in an American way. And so while my American heart, when we lose to Canada, is hurt, it is, um, there is a sense of joy in watching them take a page uh, out of our book and um and and what they are now they will have 
what, if they finish this off in the way that we think we're going to finish it off, they will have had an incredible campaign and gotten back to the World Cup, the Men's World Cup, uh, for the first time since 1986. An incredible accomplishment. And that it's happened, that it took so long is pretty, pretty amazing. But uh, they will be back there. There's nothing that says they won't get to the World Cup and lose all three games and bomb out in the, uh, in the group stage. Uh, in the same way that with all of the doubt and uh, the worry and the cynicism when it comes to Tata Martino in Mexico right now, and there's plenty of that, it doesn't preclude them from getting to a World Cup and getting to that fifth game. That's where I was going to go next. So uh, Mexico finished the window by eking out a 1-0 home win over Panama. Raul Jimenez with a late penalty. It's, it's interesting. They're, they're level on points with the U.S., behind on goal difference. So it's kind of a similar deal where... Not playing that well, but getting the points in good shape to qualify. So I've been listening to the Mexican media, and they're also in this sort of weird in-between of not sure quite what to make of this campaign. The interesting difference between the U.S. and Mexico is because they don't have the ghosts of four years ago of not qualifying, it doesn't even cross their minds that they're not going to make it. So most of the criticism is in the realm of, boy, playing like this, we're not going to do anything in Qatar. They're, they're thinking that. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, so here we are, U.S. and but Mexico, I, both But I also think points. that there's a difference in, in yes, there is there is a worry, but I think that there's much more... Um, cause for optimism and real optimism out there when it comes to the U.S. because of the youth involved. I mean, this is a long-in-the-tooth type of Mexico team, and I think that that is where a lot of the criticism and rightfully is uh, is being directed in that, okay, they, they qualify for the World Cup, but what are they going to look like in November and December down uh, in Qatar? And I think that while we can argue and have problems with what is happening with the U.S. team, I think in general, we all feel that the ceiling is very, very high when it comes to this team relative to uh, someone like Mexico. Mexico do have an easy schedule down the stretch. Even if they were to lose to the U.S. at Azteca, their last two games are away to Honduras and home to El Salvador, which if they absolutely need six points in those games, I think they'll get them. So I don't see any world in which Mexico doesn't make it. If I had to, listen, we're weeks away. I I reserve the right to change this prediction. But if I had to guess how it's going to play out, I think... um, Mexico will eke out a win over the U.S., uh, and then Panama will beat Honduras. So the U.S. will be only one point above Panama. Everybody will be nervous, and we'll build up that game on FS1, U.S.-Panama in Orlando as the the biggest game in Greg Berhalter's career. The U.S. will do the job that day. They'll beat Panama. They'll qualify for the World Cup by virtue of that result. Mexico will qualify as well. So I think this is going to be resolved before the last match day, save for perhaps the Panama-Costa Rica fighting for that playoff spot that might still be up for grab so if i had to guess i think that's how this is all going to shake out all right let's move on to some other stuff but before we do i just want to thank everybody uh up in minnesota whether you are minnesotans uh that were at the uh at the stadium and the leading up to the game uh and the incredible hosts that you were or you came in for the game thank you to everybody for making it a really uh fun and joyous type of environment and um something that uh, something that I will absolutely uh, never forget. It was really, really interesting. And I know there's people out there that, that will continue to, you know, to scream and yell. And that's okay. That's, uh, that's part, of, uh, part of what we do. But for the people that were there, especially the, uh, you know, the native uh, Minnesotans, this was a moment for pride. And this was a moment of celebration of not just what they have in terms of their stadium and their soccer there, but, but who they are. And the, the weather conditions... Um, they they took an, they took a strange pride in being able to do what they did out there, and um, it doesn't mean that <laughs> that they wouldn't enjoy a game in a in that uh, in that beautiful stadium in beautiful weather. But they certainly made uh, lemonade out of lemons, shall we say? Yeah, Frozen you, lemonade. You, you were fired up that night. Some even likened it to a WWE uh, telecast. Had that kind of. Feel. You know what? I'm not going to sit around here and apologize for bringing energy uh, to a broadcast. You know that is that is part. Nothing drives me more crazy than when I watch a broadcast that has no energy and no passion. And look, that's not just dependent on volume. Just because you say something louder um, doesn't make it necessarily uh, more energetic. But we had. You know, we had people around us and uh, the set was there and everybody was in a good mood and then people were drinking frozen beer and doing all this kind of stuff. So yeah, I was excited. I was excited to be amongst, amongst people in, a, in a, a social and communal setting, especially over the last couple of years and to have it be that n- unique and to feel the appreciation from everybody else that was out there, that we were there. And, you know, I watched the whole game from, uh, from outside. And I bundled up. I had a bunch of different layers on and snowmobile pants and, 
and my hat, which is now 2-0 and in World Cup qualifying. So uh, we'll see if we have to break it out. Who knows? Maybe we'll have to, if we really, really get desperate, we might have to break it out down in, uh, in, or, in Orlando. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what else? Uh, CONCACAF 2021 Player of the Year nominees. Oh, yeah. Let's we start, should just go over Start that. with the right. men. Mm-hmm. Christian Pulisic, Weston McKinney, uh, Chucky Lozano, Alfonso Davies, Jonathan David, Mikel Antonio. Um, interesting mm. thing here is there were two CONCACAF international trophies given out in 2021. The U.S. won both the Nations League and the Gold Cup. Pulisic and McKinney obviously played a starring role in the Nations League triumph, not so the uh, Gold Cup. And the U.S. performing reasonably well in qualifying. So that would perhaps be the argument. And, and also you throw in uh, their club exploits. Christian Pulisic won a UEFA Champions League title in 2021. Mm-hmm. McKinney thriving for Juventus. So that would be the argument there. Although I, people seem to be leaning more towards giving it to one of the Canada guys. Jonathan David in particular uh, won Ligue 1 with Lille and has been spectacular in qualifying for Canada who are poised to reach their first World Cup since 1986. Yeah, I would think it would be either Weston or Jonathan. Yeah. Um, I know uh, Matt Doyle was upset that Kyle Lahren wasn't one of the nominees and made a pretty convincing argument. He won the Turkish League title with Besiktas mm-hmm. and he's been phenomenal as well for in Canada in qualifying, scored against the U.S., recently so um you would probably bump out chucky lozano yeah get him in there it's probably jonathan david i would think yeah um i don't know how people are ultimately going to vote but yeah um and then on the women's side uh lindsey haran crystal dunn so two u.s uh players in there stephanie mayor of mexico and then christine sinclair stephanie labe and jesse fleming uh bear in mind canada in 2021 won the olympic gold medal yep. so kind of think one of their players should win it probably yeah yeah, I think so. I mean, it, it, it's a year when, yeah, it's a, it, it's a year. I mean, this is this is the year of Canada. Let's be honest. <laughs> so, uh, what, what they have done. So, yeah, I would go with a Canadian player. Um, and I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm good with it. We won't get into this today because we don't have time. But trust me, we will. Uh, some interesting happenings with the U.S. women's national team. Some some fairly big names left off their latest roster. There might be a little bit of a yeah. We'll talk about uh, we'll talk about that next uh, next week. It's a, a a changing of the guard, and sometimes the changing of the guard is not done in an uh, orderly or or comfortable fashion, <laughs> which is okay. It's all right. It's I mean, Vlaco was was brought in to move this team forward, and um, What's the, what's the saying? Uh, time is undefeated. Father time is undefeated or anything. So uh, they may be moving forward. And uh, as much as that might irritate some out there. Uh, and then finally, in wrapping up this first segment, there was a slew of interesting MLS news the last few days we should get to. Mm-hmm. Uh, Josie Altador reportedly on his way to New England, who Bruce Arena getting the band back together. They traded for Sebastian Legette. They signed Omar Gonzalez. Looks like they're going to acquire Josie Altador. Um, and then remember, they still have those three DPs, Buxa, Bo, and Hill, although there's a strong possibility Buxa is going to go to Europe at some point this year. I guess it would have to be in the summer now, <laughs> the January windows closed. But, um, so, uh, what do you make of this Josie Altador potentially off to New England? I mean, we're going to talk more about, again, because it's just an evergreen type of topic about the number nine position for the U S men's national team. And again, nobody has filled the shoes of Josie Altador. Will, will he get a, uh, a resuscitation, if you will, of his of his career. I mean, he's definitely in the twilight. Um, there's nobody better to do that than someone like Bruce Arena. Who scores more goals this year in MLS, uh, Altidore or Insigne? Insigne. Really? I'll go with Altidore. How about that? Oh. So you, I was going to ask you this. You think there's a world in which he has a good enough season with New England where he could still get himself into that World Cup squad? <laughs> I hope that world doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> no matter how many goals he scores, I mean, but what, you know, we'll talk about it later. It's it's just not it's it's not a good position. It is a glaring problem for Greg Berhalter and the national team. On the topic of New England and transfers, I thought all along Matt Turner would be going in this window. And credit to Doug McIntyre, our guest in last week's excellent podcast, uh, who pointed out to me, you know, we're on deadline day. This actually hasn't been officially announced yet. Um, and and lo and behold, we find out the deal wasn't done yet. It looks like he is going to go, but only in the summer. Right. So that's the latest there on Matt Turner, likely headed to Arsenal in the summer. Uh, yeah. So he'll he will get a half of a year, half of a season more of games than because this is going to be the, the the talk is going to be we're going to have two goalkeepers that you know who knows something could could change, but if you had to if you had to think about it right now, two goalkeepers that are not starting for their Premier League teams. 
Uh, next up, Shakiri goes to Chicago. Okay. Shakiri, who signed with Lyon last summer, has been playing for Lyon this season. You wouldn't know that by looking at a rundown where Luis Aguilar referred to him as Liverpool midfielder Sheridan Shakiri, but he is in fact a Lyon player. Yeah, this is a this is an interesting signing. I mean, this again, Chicago has been irrelevant for a number of years, even with <laughs> not just one rebrand but two rebrands. Uh, and the good and bad that came with that, even with a move back down to downtown. And I know it, you know, the timing wise was, was horrible with, uh, with COVID. So, you know, they're hopefully going to do some things, uh, whether it's signings, whether it's Ezra Hendrickson as the new coach to make them, you know, make us care, make a, you know, make, make all of us say, yeah, I want to watch a Chicago fire game. And I'm not talking about fire diehards that are out there. You know, the mass is out there and this type of thing, will pique some interest and we'll see how it plays on the on the field because that's the most important thing next up the la galaxy uh are reportedly finalizing a deal for douglas costa uh now i might upset our good friend mr karofsky here but uh this is a risky risky move uh he is 31 but he's an old 31 he's had all sorts of injury issues struggled to stay on the field the last few years and i don't know they're talking about potentially as a dp signing which um it has a little bit of a Pato Orlando City feel to it. Although yep. in that case, Orlando didn't pay that much money, so there wasn't that much risk. If it's a DP signing, then you really need him to perform. And there, there is, I did see a lot of tweets about this. There is this notion that at a time when uh, you see signings like Tiago Almada and Facundo Torres and, and MLS sort of moving in that direction mm -hmm. of younger South American players, that the Galaxy are still stuck in an old mentality of these aging superstars uh, do you think there's anything to that? Do the Galaxy need to evolve and realize that it's not about these Chicharito, Douglas Costa guys? No, I mean, I think, I think that the Galaxy and others can still have a, a balance. It, I don't think that they are necessarily living in the past. They do need to make um, a splash because they are the Galaxy. But, you know, if the Galaxy had, had done the Insigne deal, that, I mean, he's a, he's a, he's a well-known player but he's not at that type of level in terms of uh, the name recognition. And a lot of times the credibility comes with the amount of money that you are ultimately spending. And the Galaxy over the years have, have done that. So I don't think that this is, I don't think this is the end of the world. I don't think that this is desperation. And look, I, you know, the Galaxy I was watching uh, yesterday in their preseason game, they beat the crap out of uh, New England. And I think that they are going to be better. I don't think that this is going to necessarily be an elite team. And I certainly don't think signing a, um, a, a Douglas Costa is going to make them elite. Uh, speaking of aging players potentially coming to MLS, next up, there are reports that DC United are considering signing Carlos Tevez. He, Carlos Tevez still play soccer? <laughs> I mean, he, I, he was effectively retired in my eyes. He left Boca. He, he hasn't played in, in forever, but... Right? Uh, I mean, look, if if this can be an, a, a Rooney 2.0 type of thing, I mean, I, it's, I mean, I'm 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 interested. I'm curious, but in a you know car crash bystander type of way, in in that I'm just here to see how ridiculous it may or may not get. Um, and as I said, if if it ends up being a, a Rooney type of impact, then I guess this is good. I mean, this is a DC United we know isn't going to spend a ridiculous amount of money, but you know, this is this is a big name. Um, but it's it's much more of a of a curiosity uh, than than anything else for those of us, and that that can get old very very quickly. Uh, he he just turned thirty eight last week, so happy birthday to Carlos Tevez. Uh, incidentally, he, he, his birthday, February 5th, same day as Neymar and Cristiano Ronaldo's birthdays. Isn't wow. That great? Those three players all born on the Good same day. Good day. Car <laughs> cosmically or karmically, whatever. Okay. Uh, Anything else? And then finally, Yedlin goes to Inter Miami. Thoughts on that? Uh, I mean, DeAndre Yedlin's had a really interesting career, obviously, um, you know, created, <laughs> if you will, as, from a soccer perspective in the United States soccer culture. And then, you know, what we talk so much now about players making that move and that platform and that pathway now. And DeAndre was you know, well before that time when it was happening so consistently and went over and I think did a really good job. Um, I think this is a good signing. I still, I still maintain that if Chris Henderson is able to, and, and by all accounts, at least on paper right now, pull this inter Miami out of the abyss that they have been in, uh, self uh, created without a doubt. And the, uh, the cheating that went on and the, um, and the problems and the restrictions that they have, 
uh, because of the sanctions that they've had because of that cheating, this will be a remarkable feat and already in the running for uh, GM of the year if Chris Henderson is able to translate all of these moves into a better uh, and improved Inter-Miami. You know, on the topic of fullbacks and Inter-Miami, I did read some stories this weekend that Marcelo, who I know is one of your favorites, mm-hmm. legendary Brazilian, uh, he's going to definitely leave Real Madrid at the end of the season. Okay. And he's trying to figure out his future. And the options, as I, as I read it, are either go back to Brazil, play for Fluminense, which is the club where he came up, uh, either go to MLS and play for Inter Miami. Evidently, that's an option. Okay. Uh, him and Beckham have a connection. And the other one is become an underwear model. Well, it's good to have it's options. It's good to have options. Um, and it's good to clarify them and understand clearly where you want to go and what you want to do. And to be fair, his buttocks are spectacular. Beautiful buttocks. Yeah. Beautiful buttocks. Um, yeah, okay. We'll, we'll, we'll see if he, <laughs> first off, if he does come to MLS, then, uh, then if he comes to Inter Miami and then. <laughs> What designation they make uh, Marcelo? Because we know they've they've gotten into trouble in the past when it comes to signing high profile uh, players from Europe and fitting them into the uh, the cap and the restrictions regarding the uh, uh, the salary cap and all that kind of stuff. All right, what else, Mossy? Anything else? That's it. All right, we're gonna take a quick break. That was a long segment. Appreciate you hanging with us. Take a real quick break. When we come back, we'll take a look around Europe. Uh, and elsewhere a little bit. All right, don't go anywhere. All right, we are back. Let's take a trip uh, around Europe because there was all sorts of doings as people uh, finished up the the window, the uh, international window, and then got back with their teams. And we were right back at it with games. Do you have uh, Do you have FA Cup fever, Mossy? You know, I'm reading a lot of stories from people that say they had lost interest in the FA Cup, but this year they've gotten back into it. A lot of people feel like the romance has returned this year. There have been some upsets, interesting results, including uh, Manchester United dumped out of the competition by Middlesbrough on penalties. It finished 1-1. To be fair to United, how is that not a handball? Uh, that, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, listen, like everybody else, I'm a little fuzzy on the handball rule. Well, that was one of the more bizarre things I've ever seen. Listen, uh, you know, it, it, these are still ultimately human beings <laughs> that are making oftentimes subjective type of uh, type of decisions. Yes, with the aid of technology and with a much more informed um, view of situations, but it doesn't mean that they're not going to, in our minds, make mistakes uh, here or there. When it, so when it comes to this game, because remember when, uh, not to bring it back around to the U.S. team or anything, but remember after the Canada game when Greg Berhalter talked about how, listen, we, we did what we wanted to do and it just didn't happen. If you're Manchester United and you look at this game, the opportunities that you had, the possession that you had, the chances that you created, um, and then to lose it ultimately, what part of you has, I guess, some sympathy for a team like that that does everything that you kind of need to do except ultimately put the ball on the back of the net? Yeah, to be fair, United have had a lot of lousy performances this season. This was not one of them. They were just unlucky here. They should have won this game comfortably. They dominated and just, as you said, I mean, the chance that Bruno Fernandes missed when uh, Middlesbrough tried to play out of the back, he intercepted a pass and then basically an empty net and somehow missed it. Ronaldo missed a penalty in the first half, so it really just wasn't meant to be. And And the Middlesbrough equalizer shouldn't have counted in my eyes, so... There's a lot, you know, that went against him there where you can... Well, mate, that's, that's the romance. That is the <laughs> romance of the, F, uh, the FA Cup. So listen, uh, if you are feeling romantic and you are enjoying what is going on with the FA Cup, then who am I to, uh, to stand in the way? There were a lot of games this weekend, so I was bouncing around to a bunch of different stuff. So I'm not fully well, romanticized when it comes the to... Other, the other romantic story is Nottingham Forest, who beat Leicester 4-1. They've already knocked out Arsenal, so they've, they've taken out the last two FA Cup winners. Um, so our, our good friend, and Jeff Hyman, who's a Nottingham Forest fan, he is buzzing. This is quite the run they're on here. Nottingham Forest was that. Um, I mean, obviously, there the, you know, there's the um, the Robin Hood thing because I'm you know growing up in the suburbs of Detroit, it was Leeds and Nottingham Forest that you kind of that, that's what permeated through back then, and this was before we had the ability to to hear. And these were the these were the brands, and then. There was a point where I went and saw Trevor Francis play for the Detroit Express, Sport and the Express, uh, and the uh, the uh, Pontiac Silverdome, rest in peace, Pontiac Silverdome. When he uh, came over, he wore white shoes, and he had played at, at Nottingham Forest. So there was all this talk about Nottingham Forest. And, you know, then I guess it's a, a case study in how to build up a brand and then how to have that brand uh, not necessarily crumble, but 
but dissolve over the years as others have taken uh, taken the place. So it's nice just from a nostalgic perspective to even be talking about Nottingham Forest. Yeah, and then both Chelsea and West Ham survived major scares. Other than that, the other big teams still in it took care of business fairly comfortably. And in the fifth round draw, they were they were pretty much kept apart. So there's not really a matchup in the fifth round of two quote unquote big clubs colliding. So um, you know, so if you <laughs> if you like romance, you know, you, you you have opportunities for upsets, but the flip side is there's a chance that if you like the big boys colliding at the very end, that this keeps alive that possibility because But there was another small team. The, the what's the what's it called? It's um oh uh, gosh, I can't remember. Uh, anyway. Borham Wood. The yeah, right. Well, that one uh, they were they were uh, around. Yeah, yeah, they are a great story as well. Okay. Um <laughs> Borham Borham Wood. Okay. We'll, we'll have to figure that one out. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, what else? All right. Let's uh, transition to Spain, where Barcelona might have turned the corner here. They had an excellent. Everybody keeps saying that. Is, have they really turned the corner, or is just everybody being hopeful that they have? Uh, maybe it's wishful thinking, but I like what I'm seeing. They they had an excellent performance. They beat Atletico Madrid four two at home. The Camp Nou was buzzing for yeah. the first time all season. It vaults them into the top four. Their January signings were major contributors. Ferran Torres played well. Adama Traore provided a real spark. Danny Alves, at 38 years of age, had, had an eventful day yes, because it was an assist, a goal, and a playing right. great, and then <laughs> loses his mind and, and, and terrible red card, which almost complicated a game there that should have been in the, be- in the bag. But uh, they get the three points. Uh, Obama Young made his debut. Uh, I don't know. I mean, this kid Gav- Gavi looking great. Yep. Pedri, if they can ever, I know it's a big if, ever get Ansu Fati back on the field healthy. I think they have a little something going there all of a sudden. And is it just, is it Xavi or is it just timing wise? This is kind of all coming together at a point who they're playing and all that kind of stuff. I think a, a big part of it is Xavi and he's doing a good job. Okay. Um, is the, uh, what do they say? The bloom off the rose when it comes to uh, Atletico Madrid? Boy, they're out of the top four and and uh, yeah, this this could be a disastrous season for them. Not so you're only out? Well. Hashtag it? I mean, he's such an institution there that it's, you kind of think he leaves whenever he decides he's going to leave. He has so much Janet Jackson. currency, but. <laughs> Janet Jackson. Um, and then the other big result in Spain, Real Madrid minus Benzema and Vinicius were able to eke out a 1 0 win over Granada, um, Asensio with the goal. And so that puts them six points up on Sevilla at the top of the table. Um, in, incidentally, they did get dumped out of the Copa del Rey by Athletic Bilbao, the same team that knocked out Barcelona. So, um, and, 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 you know, I'll do that here. I mean, I could have gone through all the leagues first and circled back to this. But um, while in the domestic leagues, there's no huge surprises at the top of the table. Most of the teams you'd expect are, you know, Bayern, PSG, Real Madrid, Manchester City. But in the domestic cup competitions, you're getting some surprises. Uh, In La Liga, Barcelona, Real Madrid, Atletico Madrid, Sevilla all out in the Copa del Rey. Uh, In Germany, the German Cup, uh, Bayern and Dortmund have both been dumped out. Dortmund went out to Yin Joyce, St. Pauli. Ligue 1, PSG lost on penalties to Nice. They're out of the French Cup. Um, it's a Ligue 1, French Cup. Um, so you're seeing, you might have some surprise winners there in some of these domestic cup competitions, which is nice. Uh, not so much in Italy. The Coppa Italia, it's pretty star-studded. Everybody who's left in the quarterfinals, so you still have Juve, Inter, Milan, Roma, Lazio. So uh, not so much there. But in some of these other countries, you're seeing some surprises in the cup competitions. But uh, transitioning to uh, Syria, where uh, the Milan derby was this weekend, and by the way, kudos to CBS because yep. they went all out for this and it looked great. They had the studio set up their pitch side um, and had all their talent there and they were rewarded with a great game. This was kind of a match point for AC Milan because Inter went into this game four points up and with a game in hand, which you think, boy, they win that, it goes to seven. And then if they win that game in hand, it would be 10 and it's kind of game over. And, and sure enough, Inter dominated the first half. Yeah. We're up 1-0. Perisic goal should have been up by more. And so at halftime, you're sort of thinking, okay, this is going to be the day where Inter really stamped their authority on this title race. And then lo and behold, it all changes in the second half. Milan makes some changes. Brahim Diaz comes on, gives him a spark. And Olivier Giroud scores twice in five minutes, only starting, by the way, because Zlatan was injured. Right. And so Milan take it 2-1. And all of a sudden, that blows the Serie A race wide open again. So that was... I mean, but this is also the proverbial, um, did Inter lose this game or did, did Milan win this game? Because, you know, again, it was interesting substitutions. It was having opportunities and not putting them away. And then this crazy moment when he of the beautiful hair, Olivia Giroud, <laughs> has, you know, just, it, it just scores two goals. And one of them, I mean, that touch 
to get himself loose on that second goal and to curl it into the far post, that was, you know, that was magical. And so, so how much, you know, how much do you, how much stock do you put into this type of result? Is this a, a seminal changing moment in, in that race? It could be. The interesting thing is, so it's now the gap is one point Inter um, still have a game in hand, but Napoli won their game beating Venezia 2-0. So they're also only one point behind and they host Inter in their next Serie A game. And by the way, even Juventus ah, are getting you ideas. There you go. Uh, they beat Verona 2-0. Both goals scored by their January signings. Vlahovic needed only 13 minutes on his debut and then Zakaria scored the other. He's going to score a lot of goals. Vlahovic. Yeah. And, you know, they, they were considered the big winners of the January window yep. and it's only one match, but it's already kind of, you know, proving out to be the case. And so then they're eight points back so yes, yeah, Syria. Things gonna happen. Sudden... Things gonna happen. It's gonna be interesting. All right. What else? Uh, and then transitioning to Germany, where not not that I ever thought we had a race, but uh, certainly this weekend, uh, Bayern beat Leipzig three two, and then Dortmund get thumped by Leverkusen five two at home. So the gap is now nine between those teams. The one positive note is Gio Reyna did come on in the second half of the yep. Dortmund game, his first appearance in five months. Had an that, opportunity, had a breakaway that was saved. So, I mean, he, he's still creating chances. Gio Reyna, an absolute lock U.S. starter. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, I hope he, he's been out almost a half a year or, 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 or more and having these problems, and it must be incredibly frustrating for him and from a U.S. perspective. This is great. This is great news. Um, you know, that, that his team lost doesn't matter from a U.S. perspective, but he was on the field and came on and knock on wood, he's going to stay healthy because I do think that if he is healthy, um, he'll be given every opportunity to be on the field. And in that relatively small sample size, he has looked very, very good for the U.S. and has brought something different. And I think something that you that you need. If if he is healthy next window, Mossy, where do you where do you play him? Because if he's healthy, somebody has to sit. The way I had another really good window, Pulisic has not had a good window, but you'd have to sit him. Um, do you, if you're, are you playing first off on one of those three on the, uh, or one of the two on either wing? Yeah, I think that has to be, you know, I know there's been some thought that he could be one of those midfield three. Yeah, if you put the other Kenny two behind Adams, him and, and, and put perhaps. Pulisic up, uh, or not Pulisic, uh, put Reyna up in front of him, but that means that you have to talk to Tyler Adams and Weston McKinney and kind of... Um, harness them <laughs> and limit them. Which, I don't know if which, I want to do that. Especially with McKinney. Yeah, Why would you want to do that? You got to let him go. You got to let him go. So I don't know. It'd be interesting. All right. Well, but this is good things. These are good things. So welcome back to the field, Gio Reyna. And then finally, league in France, uh, PSG, as I mentioned earlier, did get knocked out of the French Cup by Nice on penalty. So they were mocked for that. But then they come back in the league and thump Lil 5-1. Messi with a goal and an assist, his best performance in a while. He so, could have had a couple more hit the crossbar. Yeah. And, so he might be rounding into shape uh, just in time for the Champions League knockout stages. Yep. Uh, Mbappe also got a goal. He said after the game, was asked about Real Madrid. There's all these reports that he's already signed. He said, no, I mean, I'm not even going to address that right now. But no, I haven't signed anything yet. He's going. <laughs> it, it's so awkward, the fact that they play each other in the Champions League. Au revoir, mon ami. Um, he, he's going. Um, and then, right. okay, so that, that's it for Europe. A couple of uh, non-European things. Uh, the Africa Cup of Nations drew to a close. Uh, on Sunday, uh, congratulations to Senegal. Uh, they not a great game. Not a great game. Not a great game by any stretch. They faced Egypt. Remember, those two countries will battle in March in a two-legged tie for a berth in the World Cup. They met here in the Africa Cup of Nations final. It was nil-nil after 120 minutes. Goes to a shootout. Senegal wins. Sadio Mane converts the winning kick. A uh, couple of things here. Uh, Egypt had uh, slated Mohamed Salah for, to be the fifth taker. It doesn't even get to him. A lot of people angry about that. Bad coaching. So, yeah, I was going to ask you, I mean, different schools of thought on it, but are you one of these people that thinks it's ridiculous to leave your best kicker? Bird in the hand, right? Uh, you know, the chances of him scoring a penalty are, are much, much greater. Uh, you know, the penalties played a big role in this entire game because we saw, um, uh, you know, obviously two teammates playing against each other in the international uh, um, arena. And we saw Mo Salah talking to his goalkeeper as... Uh, Mane was going to take a penalty in regulation, and he ended up he ended up missing, which then he made up for in the actual uh, in the actual shootout. But it was interesting to to see the gamesmanship even between not just teammates, but I'm assuming friends, cordial. <laughs> I don't know if they're best friends or anything like that. But all of that on display was uh, was fun to watch. Uh, 
Do you think it's uh, shameless for European clubs that fought to keep their players out of this competition to be tweeting congratulations to the ones that won it? We're so happy for you. This yeah, is it's, great. It's hypocritical, <laughs> uh, and but it's not it's not surprising, you know. And you know, again, I think it's ultimately it's disrespectful, and uh, in a day and age where many of those clubs and or their social media uh, departments will go out of the way to tout and prop and uh, tell everybody what to think. Um, it's just interesting that the that this would happen. So on the heels of that, Sadio Mane had this quote mm -hmm. um, talking about winning the Africa Cup. Nation. It's the best day of my life and the best trophy of my life. I won the Champions League and some other trophies, i.e. the Premier League. <laughs> but this is the special one for me. This is more important for me. Uh, if you're a Liverpool fan, would you take offense to that? That's that's become a bit of a story. If you're an asshole, yeah, you take it. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't listen. I get that there is, uh, there there are you know sometimes, um, you lose sight of the fact that you are a citizen of the world. I get that can happen, and maybe more so more so than any place when it comes to the EPL and how they look at who they are, and they tend to ignore and in that ignorance they disrespect everything that goes on outside and so while everything to them might be in this case we're talking about liverpool that one of their players actually says publicly how important this is i think it probably is jarring to them because they can't fathom that anything could possibly be more important than epl uh, when it comes to uh, playing. And by no means does that mean that he doesn't appreciate everything that he has or, or you know, uh, doesn't appreciate the money that he makes and the opportunities uh, that he had. But your country is something special. And I know in this day and age, it's kind of, by some, um, the ease in which we dismiss it. I, I, think it's, I think it's concerning. And so I love it. I love that someone like Mane will come out and very publicly say how much it meant to him. Because in this day and age of money and, and uh, cynicism out there, this is pure. This is something that has nothing to do with money. This is, this is something that, that he is proud of because of what it represents to him and his heritage and his culture and his country. And um, it makes me very, very happy to see those types of things. And uh, if you are angry or upset or critical of that, then you're an asshole. <laughs> uh, and finally, the Club World Cup, the semifinals are set. Al-Hilal hammered Al Jazeera 6-1. 6-1, yeah. Uh, so they set up a date with Christian Pulisic and Chelsea in the semis. Al-Hilal, uh, who feature Mateus Pereira, who's a Brazilian that was turning out for West Brom uh, the last couple of seasons. I was texting with our good friend Mark Young about that mm -hmm. this weekend. One of the weirdly entertaining aspects of the Club World Cup for me every year is seeing these Brazilians who I had forgotten about pop up in these Middle Eastern and Asian clubs. Right. <laughs> Guys who, you know, went the money... Gra gra oh, how route. dare you? How <laughs> dare you, Mossy? You can... um, so uh, well, how did our CONCACAF uh, friends do? The other uh, semifinal will be Palmeiras <laughs> of Brazil against Al Ali of Egypt. Al Ali knocked off Monterey 1 0, oh. which was surprising considering the fact that several of Al Ali's best players are on the Egypt team that was playing in the Africa Cup of Nations. So it could have been more. So it could have been more. And by the way, they're hoping to get those players back for this Tuesday semifinal against Palmeiras. It'd be tight turnaround. They might be right. tired, but uh, nevertheless, I mean, they, they could have some reinforcements. They already beat Monterey with the team they had, and now they could have some reinforcements for against Palmeiras. These two teams met in the third place game last year. Ali won on penalties after a nil-nil draw. And their coach, very outspoken. He's had some quotes that are getting a lot of play in the uh, Brazilian media. First of all, he questioned why the South American team gets a buy in this tournament. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, I totally agree with yep. him. Now, conceptually speaking, I don't think anybody should get a buy, but there's at least some footballing justification for the European club, considering uh, the European team has won the last eight editions of this tournament, 13 of the last 14. You could argue that... that Nobody gets a buy in a World Cup. No, no, it's fair. Like I said, I wouldn't do it. But if you're going to give it to somebody, they've at least earned that. The South America earned it. No, they haven't earned it. It's a, it's a whole new tournament. I don't understand. It's ridiculous. Okay, but okay. but but it's even more ridiculous for the 
uh, South American team to get one. I mean, there's now d- a decade's worth of empirical evidence that the South American team belongs in the pile with everybody else. It's become a 50-50 proposition for them in the semifinals. They've lost it five times in the last 11 editions of this tournament. So why we treat the South American team like they're on par with the European team and also deserve a buy. And then, and then because maybe Chelsea says, or the English league or, or UEFA says, well, we're not sending a team unless we get some sort of concession out there. And they, well, yeah, leverage they, that because it's in the middle of the European season. They, they, <laughs> Stop crying. Come on. <laughs> um, the, the other thing this Alali coach has come out and said, which by the way, I also agree with him a hundred percent on is that Brazilian football isn't what it used to be because all the teams now are more pragmatic and reactive and they don't even like having the ball. And so he's saying they're going to come at Palmeiras and, and they're not afraid at all because Palmeiras have no ability to be on the front foot and to take the game to them. So they're going to take the game to Palmeiras. So this guy is really... So he's, so he's saying the romance is dead. There is no more romantic soccer when it comes to Brazil. Absolutely. This guy is really spiced up. I can't wow. wait. This is... Uh, Goodness, we're taping okay. this in the money. This is tomorrow morning. F- I like it. FS2, I believe. All right. I like it. I like um, it. Anything else, Mossy? Uh, that is it. All right, we're going to take another quick break. When we come back, it's time for Ask Alexi. We've got uh, some questions uh, from the hotline, too. All right, don't go anywhere. All right, we're back, and uh, it's time for Ask Alexi. Use that hashtag, Ask Alexi, out there on all the social media channels. And, of course, uh, you call us on our State of the Union podcast hotline, which, as you know, is 657-549-2297. That's 657-549-2297, and you leave a message. And, and hopefully it's something interesting and uh, informative and entertaining and efficient. <laughs> in the way that you answer it or that you, uh, that you ask. Well, we get some really good calls uh, on the hotline like we got uh, this week. Mossy, what uh, the people want to know this week? Uh, first audio question, it's Bill from Indiana who asks. Hey, Alexi. Hey, Mossy. This is Bill from Indiana. First off, I want to say, Alexi, uh, you did a great job Wednesday night. You know, you were sitting out there in the cold and during that for the fans uh, to help with the broadcast. And I'll say, you were the only one in the broadcast that made it seem like you weren't having a fun time out there in the cold. So, uh, great job. Thanks for that. Um, question is regarding just, uh, during this, uh, World Cup window, uh, which players do you think increased their drafts or their stock the most? Um, I, I would say that I was really impressed with, uh, Luca de la Torre, even though we only saw him in one game and it wasn't, uh, you know, a great opponent. He was still really impressive. And do you think we may be seeing more of him in the future? All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, Well, thank you, Bill from Indiana. uh, And thank you for the kind words. Uh, Look, if the worst thing in your life is you have to travel to Minnesota and uh, talk about soccer in a sold out stadium, then you live a charmed life. And I do. And I had a wonderful time, as I, as I mentioned before with everybody there and, um, you know, they were bringing the energy, which then makes me and my colleagues bring the energy. And we, we fed off of that. And it was wonderful. I had a really, really good time and it wasn't, it was cold, but it wasn't cold where I couldn't function. (laughs) Marisa do maybe was a little, uh, a little different, but we, we layered up and we were, uh, we were well prepared. And as I said, I, I sat out there with everybody and I watched the game and enjoyed it. And, uh, then once my work was done, then I partook in the uh, in the frozen beer, and that was uh, that was fun. Okay, uh, increased stock. Uh, you mentioned uh, Luca De-, De La Torre, who for a lot of people they've been calling to see this young player, um, and I, and I think he definitely increased his stock. Still limited. Uh, his first start, his first real big game, but again, as Mossy came on with uh, the Eeyore. Uh, opinion over there that uh, this wasn't a very good team that they were playing, and so you only play what's in front of you. And I think that this will give him a second look in terms of the national team and the way that uh, Burhalter views him. But it's a crowded midfield, and there's a lot of different options out there. And I would just be careful to put all of your eggs in the basket relative to that one time that we uh, that we saw him. You know, I liked. I thought he grew into the game, to be quite honest with you. And that's not an easy game to grow into. I know we talked about the opponent, but you know the surface wasn't great because it actually started to freeze. And his ability to get out of pressure, his ability to at times get out wide um, and to start things out wide, his ability to um, not just get away from pressure, but to be fouled in that moment, which we know how important uh, set pieces were 
in that uh, in that game and ultimately where the uh, the goals came from. So yeah, I think he increased his stock without a doubt. Um, I don't think that, for example, uh, Pepe changed our perception of him. He's going through an interesting moment right now, but there's also nobody pushing him or anybody else when it comes to that nine position. I thought that uh, Weston McKinney solidified his spot as the best player on this team and had just another really, really good uh, window. And he's starting to, you know, while he does maraud around uh, at times, um, I, I think there is a method at times to the madness. Sometimes he goes on walkabout and it, it can cause problems. But for the most part, he forces the issue. And I like having players on the field that will do that. And I will take the good with the bad because there's a whole lot more good than bad when it comes to Weston McKinney and the things that he, uh, that he does. Uh, what about you? Anybody uh, stand out to you from, uh, from these three games? Other than De La Torre, not really. Yeah. The other guys that played well are guys that, like McKinney that you know you'd expect. So. Yeah, Wea. I mean, I know we missed the Canada game, so I think he had another uh, ha- had another good window. And we talked about the Pulisic situ- uh, situation. I think uh, Walker Zimmerman ag- again kind of showed that him and Miles uh, for now are going to be the starting tandem going forward. But you still got the John Brooks situation. I, I don't know how far that train has. I think it's left the station, but how far? Who knows? Maybe it could be called back at a at, at a certain point. Uh, and Chris Richards, who hurt his foot, so there there are different options out there. But I, I think I don't think necessarily other than De La Torre, I don't think anybody really set themselves apart. And other people's other people just kind of confirmed what we what we were thinking about them. Anything else, Mossy? What, what what else have we got here? So another audio question. This okay. one, David from Los Angeles. Hey, Alexi and Mossy, this is David from Los Angeles. Uh, my question to you guys is, after seeing Ferreira, Sergeant Pepe, and Sergeant his PFOP all struggle as nines for the national team, do you guys have any blame to be put on the system versus uh, the individuals? Um, that's my question for you guys. And keep the killer work. Also, Alexi, uh, Rat as band, it's a little overrated. Oh, <laughs> but, wow. Wow, you were doing so well until the end where you had to take a shot at the, the greatest rock and roll brand in, uh, in history, which is rat as everybody knows. Um, look like any band at times they have done things that probably be, probably have been overrated, but you know, it's, it, it's my thing. And so I, I don't look at any of it as being overrated. There's things that I like better than, than other things, but overrated, uh, no. And I, and I, I, I know what you're doing. I know you're poking. And, um, while I can, in, a little bit appreciate and respect uh, what you're doing. You can be better, and you know that 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 was uh, that was unnecessary. Now, as it uh, uh, David from Los Angeles, uh, to your question about the number nine position, and you know we've we've talked about this now, and we will continue to talk about it because I don't think unless some somebody just completely is, uh, you know, the soccer gods hand it to us on a plate. Uh, maybe you're Josie Altador or something like that. This is going to be a continued source of problems for Greg Berhalter and this team, the number nine position. And that's nothing that we haven't talked about uh, before. But is it something that Greg Berhalter is doing? That's an interesting, that's an interesting question. The, the formation, if you will, which doesn't always dictate how they play, has been pretty constant. And we've seen at times a back three and we've seen at times a back five, whatever you want to call it. But for the most part, it's been a back four. You've had the three in the middle, and then you've had that that uh, that spear up top with the three. And in that nine position, being the, I guess, the lone striker, if you will, relative to two up top, which we don't see a whole lot when it comes to the modern game. And I don't think that that is going to change. Um, I, 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 While we criticize the, the number nines and this, uh, this revolving door of players up there, I think... I think it's hard. I mean, whether it was Jossie, whether it's Pepe, they, they don't get a lot of opportunities. I mean, Pepe had that one where he tried to bike it, and that's just making something out of nothing. But we are lacking consistency when it comes to chance creation, especially when it comes uh, into the box. Now, you also have to look at the set piece situation out there. That came from someone like Wea, who I did think had a good uh, couple of games, forcing the issue out wide. We don't have that balance on both sides because Christian Pulisic evidently has decided that he does not want to beat anybody out wide. And with Robinson coming down that left-hand side, sometimes, as I said, that neuters Christian Pulisic and he feels he has to come inside, which is where he gets into problems. I, if, I think I would argue that if we had the same type 
of play on that left hand side that we have on the right hand side from uh, from Wea that more chances would be created. I, I, I so while I am worried about who that number nine is going to be, I also a part of me says it's not necessarily fair to scream and yell too much about them because they just haven't been getting that opportunity. And as I said last week, you can have Lewandowski up top, and if he's not getting service, it's not going to happen because none of the nines that we have are creating anything like a Ibrahimovic on their own with what's uh, with what's going on. So I I I mean, but but maybe a change of system or a change of philosophy when it comes to Greg Berhalter would open up the floodgates and any one of these nines that we're talking about would then have those opportunities to be able to finish. I, I, I'm be, I'd be even more concerned <clears throat> if these nines were getting those opportunities and were fluffing their lines. We're not even getting to the point where they can fluff their lines. What about, what do you, about you, Moss? Do you think a, a change in, in tactics from Greg Berhalter would unlock some of these players? Yeah, I think the buildup's been a little too slow, and you're right. Ironically, the the one guy that I think did get really good service and and has only himself to blame for not getting a goal was Jesus Ferreira in that El Salvador game. He yep. had some chances that he that he didn't put away. Yep. Uh, but for the most part, yeah, you're right. It hasn't been you know we we harp on the number nines, but it hasn't been like they've been incredibly wasteful and missing all these easy chances. They just haven't been getting the chances, so that is a problem. And look with you know Josh Sargent having a great game. I mean, literally, it's like a great game. We'll see if he can parlay that into more great games. And with PFOC uh, continuing to score, it'll be interesting to see who those number nines are that get called into this next window. We've already talked about how important this next window is going to be. And at some point, we're going to have to score some goals and create opportunities. And I, I, your guess is as good as mine as Who's going to get called in and then who ultimately is going to be in that nine position when that game against Mexico, that first game of the three, happens? Oh, what else? Uh, we'll end with a Twitter question. Jay Alexander asks, uh, Pulisic scored or assisted for eight straight goals for the U.S. men's national team in qualifying four years ago. Is Bruce Arena a better coach for Pulisic than Burhalter? Seems that Burhalter still doesn't know how to use Pulisic. I think Bruce Arena had Christian Pulisic at a very different time in his progression. Uh, where he had nothing to lose, he had little to no pressure, and it was all new. He was wide-eyed, and now even even at his still young age, he's seen the world and some of the realities and some of the harsh realities when it comes to the world that he is going to have to live in and function in and try to be successful in. So I just think it's an unfair comparison unless we were to see Bruce Arena in this moment with all of the different players. I mean, we we look at the like the game the other day. Who was part of that team in the last cycle? Pulisic, who didn't start. Acosta uh, was there. Um, was Jordan Morris there? Maybe, maybe not. I can't remember if he was, uh, he was around, but very limited players have gone through that cycle. Christian Pulisic was one, and he was he wasn't being asked to do anything other than just beat people and, and do the damage. And just, so I just think it's an apples and oranges type of thing. Ultimately, if I had to pick either, you know, if we were doing a, a, a pickup game or something like that, you have Bruce Arena or Greg Berhalter. Or, by the way, you could not find two more diametrically opposed type of visions of game and life when it comes to Greg Berhalter versus uh, Bruce Serena. I'd probably go, if I had to win one game, I'd probably go with Bruce Serena. So Bruce Serena would not be taking a selfie during a game. Bruce Serena would not only take the selfie, but he'd tell anybody that had a problem with it to fuck off. Okay? I mean, that's, that's the beauty of Bruce Serena. And, and look, I don't, I don't think that Greg, Greg Berhalter hasn't thought about doing that, but Greg also, he's very calculated in a good way. And, you know, also, you know, Greg's much younger. Bruce Serena's been around. He's got plenty of FU money and he doesn't, he's never suffered fools. He doesn't care what anybody thinks. And so, yeah, I'm not sure. Would Bruce have done that? Yeah, I could still see Bruce doing something like that. It's funny. Why, why would you say FU the second time? I know. I don't know why. You've already. I I've lost track. <laughs> I, I did find myself, you know, we just did a qualifying game at home to Honduras. I did find myself reminiscing about four years earlier in the Hex. We also did the game home against Honduras. They won 6-0. Clint Dempsey had a hat trick. Pulisic, it was his breakout game. He was absolutely sensational. And I don't know why, but I, as seeing Pulisic come on and sort of thinking about where he's at in his career now, I did find myself hearkening back to that day four years ago. It's, you know, as you, as you grow up 
and as the like I said, the, the the realities and the harsh realities become more apparent, you either adapt and embrace them to the extent that you can, or they become unbearable. And I don't I don't know which way it's going to go. And sometimes you just have to work uh, work through it. But it, it's just it was just such a different time, different circumstances, and obviously a very different player and ultimately person that Christian Pulisic was in those moments when he was, um, you know, scoring goals and playing very, very well consistently for the national team. That is it. That's it. Well, listen, thank you everybody for your questions out there, uh, either on the platforms uh, using the hashtag Ask Alexi or using our number. Again, number once again is 657-549-2297, 657-549-2297. We appreciate everybody, regardless of how you get in touch with us, we appreciate everybody uh, caring and getting in touch with us. I will again tell you that um, my limited times on the road, it still is amazing to me how many people come up and talk about the pod Ask about you, Mossy. Um, they, you are resonating out there with the folks. Uh, they love you and what's not to love. Um, I, even somebody came up and asked me, how's Moose? You know, so last week when you uh, told us that that was your neck, uh, your nickname growing up, t- was I, I, I told the guy, I said, I, I, I thought I knew everything about him, but there's always another layer when it comes to Moose. And that that was your nickname. And we didn't know that going on. is just amazing to me. So, But now we know that story. And again, it is out there in the in the soccer land of people that uh, that listen to the pod. So we, we, we can't thank you enough for listening to it. All right, we're going to take another quick break. When I come back, it's the end of the show. And at the end of each and every show, I give you my one for the road. Don't go anywhere. All right, we're back. And uh, it's the end of the show. And so it's time for my one for the road. Uh, Mossy, what's uh, what's happening this week, uh, this Sunday, uh, uh, over around uh, our neck of the woods? Uh, the Super Bowl. The Super Bowl. The climactic game and moment and event for the National Football League, where their two finalists of their playoffs come together. Uh, you have the, um, the Bengals of Cincinnati against the, uh, the Rams. Is it the Rams of Los Angeles? Correct. Over here at uh, SoFi Stadium. I haven't been, have you been to the SoFi? I have not. I haven't either. I heard it's incredible. Well, um, I think I told the story the other, the, the 2026 other day. 2026 World Cup final. Yeah, there we go. It's, it's definitely, that's happening. Okay. Um, and it's certainly going to be a venue, uh, but it could even host the final because it's it's that amazing uh, from what I have told. So it is um, the Super Bowl. Everybody kind of stops what they're doing and gathers around. And it is a event for the world, but let's be honest, for the U.S. And it transcends sport. And whether you follow the NFL or not, uh, we have parties and get-togethers and all that kind of stuff. Not that we need an excuse, but this is the perfect excuse to have those types of things. So when the, um, when the playoffs uh, came around, the end of the regular season, uh, my wife, who is a huge NFL fan, and football fan in general, college, we've talked about her college, uh, watching college and Ohio State and all that. And when it comes to NFL, you know, she's, she's a, tr- a Detroit girl and it's the Lions. So that's never, never good. But the end of the regular season came. Uh, so not only is my wife a, a huge football fan, but she's a gambler. Okay. And at the end of the season, she had an epiphany. She, she got up one morning and said, this is going to the, be the year of Cincinnati. Okay, and this was back when the Cincinnati um, college team was still in the Final Four or whatever and stuff like that. So um, she made some calls, shall we say, and uh, wanted to capitalize on this. Now, obviously, she hadn't watched FC Cincinnati, uh, thinking that you know this was going to be the year of Cincinnati. So she ended up betting on Cincinnati teams. Didn't go well from a, from the uh, college perspective. But obviously, from the professional expect, uh, perspective, it has gone very, very well. When she bet on the Cincinnati Bengals to win the, the Super Bowl, they were, let me get this right here, plus 2,800, okay? So she stands to win a tremendous amount of money if uh, they were to win on Sunday. Here's, here's my question, Mossy, and maybe you, you folks out there can help me, and it's, it's, it's kind of time-sensitive here. Um, if, if you had the opportunity to buy Super Bowl tickets, all right, and, and the Super Bowl tickets cost a lot of money, right? 
because this is kind of the end product of this uh, <laughs> this incredible journey that she's been on with this team that she just kind of plucked out of thin air and said they're going to win the Super Bowl. W w should I buy my wife the tickets to the Super Bowl uh, so that she can kind of have that final moment uh, in, the, in the Super Bowl? Now, if I were to do that, given how expensive they are, whatever she, uh, whatever she wins is going to be much less than what it cost me to, to send her to the Super Bowl. What do you think? Yeah, why not? You think? Yeah. I went to a Super Bowl many, many years ago in Miami. Um, I think, I, don't, I can't remember who won. It was like the New Orleans Saints. Does that sound right? Would they have in 2010 uh, maybe? Does that sound right? Yeah, I don't they, know. Drew Brees, right? They, maybe that's New Orleans, what it is. They wanna, maybe that's what it is. I couldn't even remember who, who what it is. So it was fun. It was great parties and that kind of stuff. So that's what I'm contemplating this week is, is spending the money uh, to be able to buy these Super Bowl tickets that, to just to get her, give her this kind of final moment. Cause she's, she's followed this team. I have pictures of her screaming and yelling. And like I said, she, she has no connection to Cincinnati. There's no real affiliation when it comes to the teams or anything like that, but she just woke up one day. So I don't know. Let me know out there if you think that I should uh, send my wife to the Super Bowl. We'll see. We'll see if it happens. I don't know. It's a lot of money for a, a football game. Yep. You know, maybe she'd just like the money. <laughs> Have you ever uh, been to a Super Bowl? I have not. Man, we got we to gotta get to a Super Bowl. I always mention this. The first podcast we ever did was uh, Super Bowl week uh, 2018, I believe, uh, Patriots-Eagles. Uh, so we, we talked about um, that game. The Eagles defeated the Patriots. Um, so we're coming up to our third anniversary? Is that fourth? Wait, 18, you said? 19, 20, 21. Fourth anniversary? Yeah. I do want to close with this. Okay. Let's say you were dating a girl mm -hmm. and you told her, hey, I'm going to leave you for a different girl. Okay. But then that new girl changed her mind and said, I don't want to go out with you anymore. So then you had to circle back to the original girl and say, hey, actually, uh, we are going to keep going out. That would be super awkward, right? Um, well, it, would it be super awkward? I mean, yeah. I don't know. How would, how would you Just frame say it yes. to this person? Just say yes. This is an yes. analogy to set up something. Okay, else. yes. It would be super awkward if you were to circle back to someone that you broke up with in order to go out to someone else who then <laughs> broke your heart and you had to come back with your tail between your legs. And I don't know what woman would take you back, but desperation you know, knows no bounds. I give you Jim Harbaugh. <gasps> oh, who, okay. Who, um, so the story here is he interviewed with the Minnesota Vikings had a, an initial interview via Zoom that he came away from thinking the job is his if he wants it, and he determined that he wanted it. Mm -hmm. So then they set up a follow-up meeting in Minnesota, which he thought was a formality. He thought he was going there to sign the contract and become the Minnesota Vikings head coach, informed everybody at Michigan, hey, I'm leaving. Thanks for the memories. See you later. Um, and then in the interim, between this initial Zoom interview and the the face to face meeting, the Vikings apparently got cold feet. They started getting calls from people who have worked with Jim Harm in the past and said, "Boy, you sure you want to do this? The guy can be kind of a pain in the ass." And so by the time he got to Minnesota for this, what he thought was a formality, it was clearly not a formality. It was this like nine hour grilling where they started asking him all these uncomfortable questions about his time with the Forty ers and why did you have an issue with this one, this guy, and that guy, and what, why are you so tough to get along with? And by the way, nine hours is quite the interview. I mean, Jim Harbaugh, from what you know, people who have interviewed him say that after 10 minutes, he starts getting bored and gives you one word answers. I can't imagine once we got to like the fifth <laughs> hour of that. Um, so anyway, the, the, he got offended. The interview was a disaster. So they, they sort of mutually agreed, okay, this isn't happening. And so then he had to turn around and call Michigan back and be like, actually, I'm not leaving. I'm coming back. And so it's incredibly awkward. The Michigan football program is in disarray. Already the offensive coordinator, Josh Gaddis, who was offended because it, for those couple of days where it looked like Jim Harbaugh was leaving, there was already chatter about who would replace him. And he thought he would be a candidate and he was informed that he wouldn't be. And he was so offended by that that he's now left, made a lateral move to go to Miami to be their offensive coordinator. Oh and there could be other coaches leaving too. There's a divide in the coaching staff between guys that, that Harbaugh was going to take with him to the Vikings and guys that he... that. Uh, he wasn't going to take. They were going to be left in limbo. We're nervous about certain players transferring because, you know, they've kind of lost trust in their coach who had promised him he was going to be there. Um, so, you know, the, the next time your wife and Stu Holden's wife organize some sort of Jim Harbaugh bashing party, I right. want in on that you this want time. In on I, yes. I'd we, like to... Well, they've converted yes. you. Yeah, so this is... 
nobody's fault but Jim Harbaugh's and and his agent's fault. I mean, that you didn't know what was going on. I actually don't think he has an agent, which is part of the problem. He's one of those that likes to go at it alone and, you know. Oh, well, then he's a moron. I mean, <laughs> he, he, he deserves what he got. Uh, but but that you would be in this day and age, maybe more so than any time in history, so vetted and uh, and and so in depth they would go and go into your background should come as a surprise to nobody, including Jim and Jim Harbaugh. And so, man, oh man, what a friggin' mess your Wolverines are. And so now you now he's got to go back. Ugh. I don't I don't know Jim Harbaugh uh, from from Adam, but he, he seems like a piece of work. This dude. Yep. <laughs> All right. With that, we thank you for tuning into the uh, State of the Union podcast. Thank you for uh, for reviewing and rating and downloading and subscribing and doing all the different things you do out there on the platforms. Uh, we've gone a little long, but I, I say that every week. We say that every week. By the way, this whole Harbaugh thing was going down in Minnesota while you were there. You I could know. have run into the guy. Well, they and, told us. They yeah. said he was here. There was even a point where we were we were at the, a bar one night. And we were like, well, let's invite him out. Let's bring him <laughs> out. I mean, he, he, he kind of likes weird, unique types of things, and this is certainly what it was, but it was not to be. The people of Minnesota said, uh, you know, Host a World Cup qualifier in uh, in February in Minnesota. Yeah, that's good. Jim Harbour for our coach. Mm, we're not going to do that. All right. Anyway, uh, my best to the people up there in uh, in Minnesota. Hopefully, we'll be back at a certain point in the future for yet another game. And as I said, in a much more um, just m warmer type of circumstances. Thank you, as always. We'll be back here again, same time, same place, here on the State of the Union podcast. And until then, and as always, size the day. You like that clip? Well, my State of the Union podcast drops every week. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.